And ladies and gentlemen, welcoming a very special guest inside the booth. He is the former king of the cage, heavyweight champion of the world, Manny Rodriguez, PFL color commentator. Welcome in, Manny. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. We got the chance to speak with George X earlier today, obviously your broadcast partner. I wanted to begin with the relationship that you guys had throughout all of the time commentating things like Premier Boxing, Bellator back in the day. When did you guys first meet and how has it been having him by your side throughout all of these different orgs? Oh, man. Okay. we. Uh, it's interesting, funny story. We first met probably two weeks before the very first season of Bellator. So it would have been uh, we started April of 2009, so it would have been like, yeah, probably like the last week of March, first week of April of 2009. I got a call from Jordan Redney. I was coaching athletes, and I'd signed some talent for him to season one of Bellator because it was on ESPN Deportes, so a lot of Latino fighters. And I was coaching at Alliance MMA in Chula Vista, so obviously yeah. we had a bulk of Spanish-speaking Latino talent. Um, and Bjorn's like, hey, you know, Ivan Salivary is supposed to do this for me, but his wife found out that it was a, a travel schedule of, you know, basically 12 weeks straight on the road. They were about to have their firstborn, and uh, and they said it was a no-go. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, hey, you know, I want you to meet the guy we have hired to do, uh, you know, the play-by-play, -play. and if you guys, you know, hit it off and he thinks you're good, then uh, do you want to do it? So we, we linked up. I called him. He came down to Carl's bed. We had a meal together. We had a couple of drinks. And, and it uh, worked and out. The rest, yeah. is, the, the rest is history, man. Like, honestly, we've been uh, on the road together pretty much since. And we've, at this point, we've called, you know, thousands and thousands of fights and we've traveled the States and, you know, a lot of the world together. So he's a, he's a good friend. He's like, he's like a little brother. It's older than me, of course. <laughs> when did your broadcasting journey begin? Because like you mentioned, you had some experience, right? Managing and, and kind of guiding other fighters' careers. You had your own competitive career. When did the uh, introduction to kind of being a commentator begin? So the first time I ever got like behind the desk was for King of the Cage, actually. It was after I was their champ. I did some guest commentary for them. And then at the time, there was a local San Diego-based promotion called Total Combat that Eric Del Fiero, who is, you know, now the head coach of Alliance and, you know, who had that gym forever, um, he was he was a promoter. So him and his ex-wife kind of ran the show and I did some commentary for them. And then, like I said, once once Bjorn gave me the call, then it was official. I was on ESPN Deportes. And uh, like I said, now George and I have done a lot of work together in multi, you know, combat sports. 100%. In different eras, I mean, you talk about the Spike TV, you know, period of time, and then the transition to ESPN, those different distribution networks, what are some of the big takeaways and improvements that ESPN has, or, or, or what keeps them on top, in your opinion, within combat sports? I mean, they just know, they know sports, they know mm -hmm. what sports people like. Um, typically, I think you have people that like when it's just TV, like the Spike era was good, because you had entertainment people, right? And they knew entertainment. So the yeah. feature pieces, those kinds of things were a little bit more elegant. They were a little bit, you know, better graphically, that kind of stuff, because it was very artistic, because that's what entertainment does. But the reality is we're a sport and ESPN does sports like yeah. no one else. And obviously, I mean, we all know sports, stats, betting, like all that kind of gets mended, blended in and you have to have a product that is able to give you everything, give you the entertainment value, give you, uh, you know, just uh, the the features and get to know the yeah, athletes, yeah. make you care about them, but also give you the other side, right? The statistics, the analysis, the breakdowns, the betting, like all that is just as important for the product. And if you don't have that nucleus, right, of like a really intriguing product, then the, yeah. the mitochondria doesn't matter. You know what I mean? All of that other additional sides of it. Um, I'm curious yeah, about it, the, also, you know, I think that the the format itself that, you know, like sure. you were saying, like it has to be a little bit different if you want it to catch on. And talking about format, of course, PFL has done such an innovative job with their league uh, format and, and the point system. You know, when when you talk about your prior career as a, a combat sports athlete, is the PFL something that you would have been like, damn, I really want to be involved in in their promotion? <laughs> uh, like, am I being honest? 
I you so, can be at us. I'm trying yes, to give you that that yeah, industry yeah, softball yeah, answer. Yeah, 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 it's a super softball. <laughs> the reality is, in theory, yes. Like you go, like of course. Uh, but I have now been in the sport long enough. Uh, my body, you know, is is <laughs> beat down enough to know that a, a season format, when you're you know re- realistically fighting, cutting weight, training. Yeah. And you're doing that, you know, four or five times. If you're a part of the the Challenger series, you can do it. Up, like Leal fought six times last year for us. Yeah, you know that's brutal. He didn't even make it to the finals. So when you when you start thinking like that, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> says like the yeah. reality is, even though my brain and my pride want to say yes, you know, like the, the shot of a million dollars, of course, but but physically, man, like like that's just brutal. Yeah, it's it's brutal to do. I don't know how these guys do it, and obviously, like I said, you've seen what happens. You know, you got guys like Pettis who came over, and and you know they're they're still athletic; they can still perform, but physically, you know, when you've been used to fighting once a year, maybe you know once. Oh, I think we lost them. All right, man. I, if, this doesn't, if this doesn't work, I really don't know what I'm going to do. The third time's the charm. Uh, I think that's what they I think that's what they say. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. I think when you got guys like I said, when you got seasoned guys like Anthony Pettis, when you got seasoned guys like Jeremy Steven, they're used to fighting at a high level, of course, and they're used to having to perform. So the pressure isn't that you know, like they, yeah. they understand that that's just part of the game. But when you're factoring the fact that they have to cut weight and, and stay disciplined and in training camp for that long a time, they're not used to that. You know, if you go back and look at Anthony's, you know, kind of fight map before he got to us, he was fighting maybe once a year. Sometimes he had to take two, three years off because of injuries and yeah. recovery. Now you're asking those guys to go back to how it was in the beginning where you're just fighting, you know, in the beginning you're fighting for money, right? So you're just fighting for like – to pay rent, to yeah. put food on the table. So you're fighting as often as you can, as often as you have to, just to be able to do that. And then you're asking them to go back to be basically when they were like newbies, when they were starving and they're trying to make it. It's kind and of after, hard to, to yeah. stay motivated like that. After you've been on a Wheaties box and have a UFC championship around the belt, that's <laughs> that's certainly a task that <laughs> may be a bit harder in, uh, in execution than it is in theory. Uh, but talking about like theory, when you when you think about the inner workings of color commentary, right, and that facilitation between yourself and a play by play, how are the ways you evolved over the time of you doing commentary, right? That work that you do with George, are there any big significant things these days where you go, man, that's something I didn't do when I started, but I've, I've learned and developed as, you know, the commentating experience has accrued. I think I got, I lucked out as a, you know, when I got into broadcasting because, because George, as much as I like to give him, you know, a hard time, (laughs) he he has a world of experience and he was a, a very good partner early on. So, you know, he kind of, hey, man, mellow out. We're just having a conversation that other people get to listen to. So just thinking of it that way kind of took a lot of the pressure off and allowed me to, you know, while I'm doing the work, still bring in, like, my personal experiences mm-hmm. uh, as a fighter, as a coach. But also, you know, I've I've had to coach in corner against a lot of the guys' coaches. So, like, I know all these guys, right? So. Uh, there's just an insight that I'm able to bring in that it's I'm able to do that because I have, you know, that comfort level with George. Yeah. Right. It, we don't have there's no like competition. There's no ego with us. We're not fighting over the microphone. We have a real flow. So I know like, you know, if if he looks like he's going to start coughing or something, <laughs> I just pick it up. You know, we at this yeah. point now we've done it. So it's very fluid. Um, but as far as the, the analysis specifically. I think everyone can talk about about like the the technique. Everyone can talk. You know, George knows technique well. He's seen enough fights that he can describe technique. But yeah. the hard part sometimes is the thought behind the technique, right? The feelings that these guys are going through. Uh, you know, the the difference between like having someone's timing and being in rhythm and not and and 
you, I'm able to see those things and I'm able to talk about them and describe them where, you know, the play by play guy, even though they, he kind of knows what's going on, he doesn't know why it's going on. If that makes mm. sense. He doesn't know what's going through the the fighters heads. He doesn't know, you know, like injuries, like he, he it's just easier for me to spot an injury, right? Because I've been in corners and, you know, and I've studied enough fights. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, habits, you, you see when people start shaking their hands you see when people start playing with their feet or, you know, kind of messing with their knees and, and, uh, and you see that reaction. And I think you only have that when you're a fighter, really, when you mm -hmm. come from that background or when you study enough as a coach or a corner that you have to recognize those things because you have to be able to call them because when a fighter's in the cage, sometimes they're just so hyper-focused on what they see that they're not seeing the entire detailed picture that you yeah. might when you're on the outside. And I would almost further it and say, even if a play-by-play -play does have prior experience fighting like a Sean O'Connell, there are just some, uh, you know, rules of the role, you know, as a play-by-play -play guy, if I'm aware of something, I'm going to tee you up to sort of say, hey, you know, why is this happening, right? What is the, the the meaning behind this, even if I know the answer? I feel like that speaks to the chemistry that you and George have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, again, that's the, the other comfort level thing. And that's the beauty and the luxury that George and I have. Mm -hmm. Right. We've worked with each other for so long and we genuinely like each other. Like we don't just hang out when we're working. <laughs> so, you know, he, yeah. he and I, you know, we will go grab a meal. When I was living in LA, we, we would get together. He, uh, myself and Jimmy Smith, we would get together once a week outside of work, whether we had shows or not, and just bullshit and catch up and talk, yeah. you know, like we're friends. And that I think also translates in the broadcast. You notice that we get along because we're playful. We joke around with each other. And it, 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 like I said, it adds that comfort level where we're not in competition for Mike time. time yeah. we're, not, we're not trying to, you know, talk over each other or I'm not trying to correct him. He's not trying to correct me on air. Right. Obviously if it's something blatant that we actually need to address on air, we do, but it's not a competition, I guess. Right. No, completely. Now, before we dig, dig into the Challenger series, I did want to take a little bit of dip back into the past. Of course, 24, uh, you had a, a diagnosis of, of testicular cancer, right? And I feel like that was right at the height of your competitive career. And that was a big obstacle, obviously, that prevented you. Um, what were the emotions and mindset that you had at that time? And how did you push through uh, that that challenge? Uh, man, uh, it was... Uh, you know, kind of a mind F to say the least. Yeah. Cause you know, uh, coming when you're, when, when you're young and when you're actively competing in a sport like MMA, you kind of have a, a invincible, yeah. type, you know, like attitude that you go into things with, you know, like it uh, doesn't matter who you're training with. It doesn't matter who you're fighting they can't hurt you. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, like I said, you get a, a cancer diagnosis like that. And, uh, you know, oncologists don't typically always have the best bedside manner. <laughs> I understand why now as an adult, but as a kid, you know, I think I was 24 and uh real short story there. The doctor's like, Hey, I have good news and bad news. It's like, okay. He's like, well, the, the good news is you shouldn't die. The bad news is you have cancer. You have to have surgery tomorrow. Wow. So like after I heard that, like literally I tuned everything else out. Luckily, I had good friends in the room with me that kind of like took notes and kind of gathered the information that we needed to. And then, you know, I went through the process. It's, you know, cancer is not like a, you know, fix. It's not a quick fix. It's a process. So it was basically like a, a very difficult year long mind fuck, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh ups and downs you know definitely there were moments where you know it was depressing and the you know the surgery itself for testicular cancer is uh not the easiest surgery right because they're cutting in pretty sensitive areas but what they do is they cut the abdominal wall uh and they go all the way through that way because they have to basically remove all of the Whatever connective cancer. tissue yeah. right so that you're getting basically a test, you know, a, a testes removed, but <laughs> everything that's attached to it too. Um, and then, you know, like I said, I'm young, I'm fighting, I'm thinking I'm tough. And I think uh, I even like popped a stitch trying to teach like a, a, a move in a kickboxing class because I would still come into the gym and like watch. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, you're, you're, I mean, I was an idiot kid. So I was just trying to, 
trying to push forward and trying to get past it. But but yeah, it was very difficult. Um, I think that 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 some of the decisions I made there ended up paying me, you know, kind of affecting my future. Like I think that that I never really allowed that part of my body to heal, like the abdominal wall to heal. So then yeah. that affected me later on with my lower back, right? Because ultimately that's why I ended up retiring. Uh, I mean, I've also been in a bunch of car accidents. <laughs> but there was and, yeah. and, and Jason Lambert and I would literally like beat the piss out of each other. <laughs> like every the whole the entire gym would stop just to watch us train. So it, there was a lot of damage. And, yeah. and again, like I, I didn't let that I didn't rehab it correctly. And because of that, because of the abdominal wall, because of the core issues, uh, my lower back was compromised. And you know, now I have disc herniations, but Jiu-Jitsu has, you know, been kind to me and kind of done that all up and down the spine. So it's not just the lower back anymore. <laughs> yeah, spread out. It got distributed. It, and it is it, what it is. It might be a, an obvious follow-up question. So apologies for the common sense nature of it. But when you look back on that period of time now with the knowledge and wisdom that you have, what are some of the bigger changes that you would have done? Because I feel like a lot of athletes these days still subscribe to that kind of mindset where they, they're they like, I'm invincible. I'm going to push through it. Um, and and in your mind, is there anything corrective that you would have done in hindsight? I mean, if if I could go back and do it over again, mm-hmm. I would I would have you know allowed my body. I would have dealt with that as an illness and not try to stay relevant and not try and stay in the gym and kind of just focused on my healing and just given that my full attention. Um, and then you know found better ways. Like I said, now I have to do yoga every day just to stay mobile, right? Like yeah. it's it's what keeps me going. Had I started that process earlier, I would have known about, you know, the fact that after I got that muscle cut that I wasn't activating it and then I was using other muscles, you know, like those kinds of things that to me now are common sense and they make sense. Uh, I was just, you know, when you're young, especially like I said, when you're competitive in fighting, you're like your whole goal is to believe you're invincible and that nothing can hurt you and no one can stop you and you can push through it and you know it's just a little bit of pain but you know you just got to push yeah. through i just uh, i wouldn't have i wouldn't have tried to do that that way i would have really focused on the rehabilitation and the healing first uh physically and then mentally because like i said it was it was very difficult mentally and and emotionally right yeah. But when you're a kid, you don't know, you don't know that. And you don't know how it's going to affect other things in your life until you have that. Hindsight. Until you're experiencing it. Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. think after a, a six, seven hour, eight broadcast, you're like, damn, my fucking back's killing me. Does that happen? Or <laughs> So honestly, like uh, uh, you could, you can catch us, but usually like George is sitting down, hanging out the whole time. I have to get up. Yeah. You know, I have to stand up and I have to like move around. And if we have a break, um, you know, I have to kind of, kind of move around, move just around. kind of get loose. Yeah. It's just part of the game now. Like I, I said, I wake it. up in the morning and, <laughs> you know, I do, I do at least 15 minutes of sun salutations before I do anything else, just to kind of get my get body the, moving, yeah. uh, and try and get the, the spine kind of like aligned, you know, I'm pretty sure Kenny, Kenny Florian is pretty bad too. <laughs> we've, been, we've been talking about our back issues lately, so that's too good talking about standing up you know there's a lot of athletes stepping up in this challenger series a couple names returning to the table a couple new ones one kiwi in particular michelle montague is uh in my opinion really capturing a lot of attention ahead of this february 3rd event what are the names that pop off the page for you obviously there's a lot of international representation um is there any significant fighter that in your prep and your analysis and your conversations with them that you're thinking this one's the one to watch i mean they all have you know, there, there's a lot of talent here, yeah. and there's some talent that we're seeing again. Obviously, we know what Jackie Catalan can do. We know that her, you know, her level. But the fight to me that right now is like the standout fight, the fight that I'm excited the most about, is the the Jesslyn Michelle fight. She's fighting mm-hmm. Evelyn Martins, and obviously, like I said, Jesslyn is like very, very physical, very big. You know, she's she's a like a a, a woman that is really going to be aggressive right uh but evelyn martins like if you if you haven't seen her she's young and uh i mean she's only 20 years old she turned pro at 18 she's been training since she was 11 
uh, I mean, she moved to the States from Brazil, uh, you know, like five years ago. She speaks fluent English. She speaks Spanish because, you know, they moved to, to Florida, yeah. right? <laughs> She's like, we, we were doing the, 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 you know, the interviews, the broadcast interviews in Spanish because it was Jorge, it was George Me. And Sean O'Connell is trying to learn Spanish, so we just did in Spanish. <laughs> Perfect Spanish. Like she, she's a very intelligent girl, very aggressive fighter. And I think because they're both so aggressive, it's gonna be like fight of the night. So yeah. those two, I think, have a good shot at making it, like to at least the finals of seeing mm -hmm. the winner of that fight. I see it as being one of the two that gets, you know, pushed to the final decision. I love it. Any other notable things about the PFL Challenger Series in particular? Maybe not this week, but, you know, extending to the heavyweights, to the featherweights. I mean, there is a lot of, of great talent that you guys are coming in through this this new product. I mean, there's a lot of great talent. And uh, I mean, I think that the, right now, my biggest like story kind of headline is, uh, man, you know, last week we had a guy step up for us, like really step mm -hmm. up for us as a as, uh, uh, a fighter right like he was there and it is st louis the kid was there to train and that uh, kind of helped with the weight cut with that gene who ended up winning the the contract right he is an alternate for the 155 division in whatever two weeks but he's there you know to help his teammate get ready they go hey man our alternate just missed weight can you make it you want to fight tomorrow he's like yep i'll do it He's like, I train every day. I'm here training with him anyway. Let's mm -hmm. do it. Shows up, makes weight, wins the fight. It's the only finish of the night, right? Wow. And, and you know, he still, you know, he still has a chance, right? He didn't get the contract, but he got the win. And now everyone knows who he is. And now, you know, he's probably going to fight again next yeah. week. Yeah. You know, with a lightweight. And then we still have the second chance, you Later know, fights road, yeah. at the end. So realistically, he could have three chances. And, you know, that's kind of what Carlos Leal needed to make it into a season last year. Absolutely. Right? He yeah. took advantage of it. So I think I think to me, he is the, the one to watch for, for the this series just because he's he's he took an opportunity, but he already has another built-in opportunity for himself, right? And he has that potential. So I there's no one else that could have a potentially three times opportunity to win this contract. He'd be the only one. Especially, but then, yeah. you know, it's one of those things, like if he does, that means he's fighting two to three times right now. And then if he makes it into the global season, I mean, he's that's right a rough schedule. Yeah. yeah. Uh, remind me his age. What was, how oh, old man, he's he? a kid. I mean, he's yeah. a kid. He's still young. He was 25. 25. I don't know. I mean, those, I feel like those weight cuts are pretty easy in the mid twenties. You know what I mean? They're able to shed those yeah. pounds, but still, no, absolutely no, a, a sacrifice. But the schedule isn't you know? easy yeah. for anyone. No, right? <laughs> like, again, you know, when you go shin to shin, when you know, when you when you get a bust up a hand or something, that, yeah, like on accident, you know, like especially like when you're landing. Mm. You know, I I remember, uh, man, who was it? Larry Landis. Uh, Larry Landis, I fought Larry Landis in King of the Cage early on. He landed an elbow on me that I think I felt for like, I don't know, like a month and a half on my face. Jeez. You know, and it wasn't like an elbow. It was like he just, it was a, in the transition of a takedown. He just landed on me and his elbow landed and on was, my yeah. face. You know, it wasn't like he was trying to, it was, but still like that kind of stuff. And and again, when, you, when you're working with the time frames that we're talking about, you know, that's what makes it difficult on these guys. Which I do love and understand the preventative measures, right? I think that the elbows are, of course, restricted. And up until last season, was it? The knees were also restricted. Um, you know, and and I and I get that play. What is your response to maybe the criticism then that PFO gets for the differentiation and rule set from the traditional, you know, mixed martial arts catalog? I mean, really, the, the big difference is the elbows. And I think yeah. everyone kind of understands that. Um, I mean, man. You, you barely touch someone with a, an elbow and, and it's, you know, especially in some of these lighter weight divisions. I mean, they're already dehydrated, right? And, you know, the elbow is a pretty bony bone. So it's just, you know, skin's going to yeah. split. And, and then you're going to end up doing what everyone hates to do, having to call in an alternate. So that would just happen so much more often that, yeah, I don't think that there's an argument to be made against it. I think it's a good rule.
For sure. Manny Rodriguez, any other closing thoughts or statements about the upcoming Challenger Series, February 3rd, the women's featherweights go at it, of course. Uh, anything else that you feel viewers should know? I mean, just tune in. I think it's going to be a very fun week. You know, this is the first time we've had women's featherweight. Um, and uh, and these girls, like, they bring it. Uh, some of the girls that we've seen at, you know, lightweight, they were already aggressive. They were already looking for finishes. And I think uh, at this new weight, they're just going to really look to push the pace. And I think we're going to have some exciting fights. Can't wait to see it. Manny, Mean Bean Rodriguez, thank you so much for the time, brother. And I can't wait to watch you on the commentating booth next to George X very soon. Awesome. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Thank you, brother.